Welcome back to Good Moms, Bad Choices. I'm Erica. And I'm Mila. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday, everyone. It is the last episode of Design Your Life August. This month has been so amazing, you know, connecting with so many different people, talking about our experiences and, you know, designing our life. And um, I'm just really excited because I think you guys have heard us talk about um, our book club. And we have been um, meeting up with our book club every two weeks. And we're reading The Ethical Slut right now um, by Janet Hardy and Dossie Easton. And it's just been so empowering, so... um, I don't know, just a lot of deep reflection happening. A lot of enlightenment. Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm connecting with my tribe just by, I'm like, I knew I wasn't the only one. I knew it. I knew this made sense. God, I I knew I could slut and be respected and happy. (laughs) Um. (laughs) And so I'm really, really, really excited. You know, Erica and I are master manifestors. Our entity is on point. And when we started reading this book and we started this book club, we were like, oh my God, we have to find... Janet and Dossie. Like we have to find them and we have to email them and they I would really like to talk to her or them. And sure enough, we found Janet Hardy and she's joining us today. I'm so excited. Thank you, Janet, the author of The Ethical Slut and Fellow Mama and Just Badass Woman for coming on our show today. Oh, my very great pleasure. I love doing these. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing today? Oh, my life is a little bit confusing right now, but you don't want to hear about that. It's not relevant to your audience, but, but it, <laughs> mo- mostly fine. <laughs> well, I'm sure no matter what audience is listening, anybody's audience always has some shit because that's life, right? Yeah. No, my stuff right now is uh, aging related stuff. And uh, you get to, you know, your late 60s and there are things to be considered. So. Someday, you know, 40 years from now, you guys will look back and say, yeah, Janet tried to tell me about that. <laughs> it, There's it's, so many secrets of being a woman that the shit people don't tell you. Right? I know. God. Including, yeah, as you, as you get older and the things that you have to really be mindful of, think about and consider. Uh, yeah. Guess we'll, we'll offline about that later. And I have, I have a bunch of questions. How can I better prepare? Um, so... Janet, at the top of our show, we typically pull a card, and so I did pull a card, um, and today's card is the Page of Cups. The Page of Cups, guys. And this card, it's a creative card for opportunities, intuitive messages, and curiosity and possibilities. Um, the Page of Cups is a... Uh, is a, it's a It's a man, he's wearing like a blue tunic with a floral print and a beret on his head that's long and a flowing scarf. He stands on the shore with a wavy sea behind him holding a cup in his right hand. (laughs) Surprisingly, a fish pops its head out of the cup and looks at the sea behind him. What does all of this mean though? (laughs) The page of cups suggests a new idea or opportunity has come to you out of the blue. Your creative energy is flowing and now the question is how you will express it. Will you snap up this new idea and turn it into something or will you let someone else bring it into fruition? It is up to you to spend the time exploring the idea and see what you want to move forward. Hmm. Hmm. It's a time of birthing it seems. Hmm. You know the fish always, like when you dream of fish they always say like someone's pregnant. And they're saying, Relax. No, I'm not saying that. There's birthing as in an idea, There's girl. three women in the room. And ain't none of us having no babies, okay? <laughs> There's no babies to be had between the three of us. Four of us. I'm getting my hair braided. Um. <laughs> oh, yes. By the way, you guys, this is yet another episode of Jamila getting her hair braided. Us getting our hair Well, yeah, I'm getting my hair braided this time. <laughs> but, you know, girls got to do what a girl's got to do. So here we are doing what we got to do. Um, Janet, do you have an affirmation that you can share today? Well, um... I'm not really an affirmation kind of a person. I get up in the morning and see what the day looks like and make my decisions based on what's ahead. So take it as it comes, I guess, is is my affirmation. Take Take it it as as it comes. comes. That's a good affirmation because I think that is. you gotta you gotta take everything as it comes. You can't over analyze and over expect. Yeah, I, it's I don't kind of an anti affirmation affirmation, but that's my life for you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but you guys, same thing. Girls gotta do. Girls gotta do. Well, you can't do anything but take it as it comes because yep. you don't know what the fuck is gonna come. Yeah, and you I gotta read kind the of most <laughs> marvelous poem the other day that this man was writing about the battle between his heart and his brain. And his brain was all in the future and his heart was all in the past. And 
he eventually wound up spending time with his lungs because breathing is what you do in the now. And I loved it so much. Yeah, I like that. It's true. It is true. Sometimes we worry so much about the shit we can't control. We forget to be present and like it ruins. You, you wake up one morning like, shit, I've been stressing for eight days or eight years or whatever. And you're like, should have been present. Um, well, I just want to jump into this book and, you know, your journey with The Ethical Slut. Um, this month's theme on the podcast is uh, designing your life. And I feel like, obviously, sex sex and sexuality is a huge part of that. Um, I just wanted to ask you, how has being an ethical slut helped design your life? Um it has less to do with who I'm having sex with at the time as, as it does with not making hard boundaries between things. Um, if the world is trying to present me two options, A and B, I'm going to be thinking about what C might be. Uh, because once you step away from the paradigm of lifelong monogamy, which let's face it, is not working very well for a lot of people, uh, then you get away from the kind of dualistic wrong is right, wrong or right kind of thinking and begin to consider all the options that are out there, including doing nothing, which is an option that I think uh, doesn't get quite as much attention as it should. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's just a more fluid way of looking at the world. That's beautiful. I, I have a question, like. Tell, can you tell us how this came about? Like, I know you've written other books, but like Ethical Slut, we're reading right now the third edition in our book club, but this is bef not before it's time because people have been having sex and being sexual for forever, obviously, we're existing. But what what per, like, what like made you, motivated you to re write this book? Like, what's your relationship with Dossie? How did you guys come together and like start this journey? Because I I'm... It's, it's go you've made the third edition, so it's going to live forever. It's something that everyone needs to hear and read through, no matter what like what life, your style you're exploring, I feel like. So I'm just curious, at that time, when you wrote this book, when it was less common and like acceptable to talk about sex in this way, how did it come about? Well, Dossie's, Dossie and I had all written, already written two other BDSM books. At the time, we'd written the bottoming book and the topping book. Uh, and so we were getting invited uh, to speak about those. And we got invited to speak. Uh, I should, I'm sorry, you asked about how we met. We met um, before we started writing books, obviously. Uh, she was doing a program at a BDSM club. And she needed a demo model for a caning demo she wanted to do. And I got wind of this and I knew Dossie to, to wave at, but not well. And I said, me, I want to do that. And so we, we met up ahead of time to go over our, our plans for the workshop and what my limits were and so on. And during that conversation over coffee, I said, you know, someone asked me the most interesting question the other day. They asked, um, okay, you have written a good book about how to be a female top or dom, and your partner Jay has written a, a good book about how to do BD, BDSM, mostly as a top or as a dom. Uh, when is gonna, someone going to write a good book about how to be a bottom? And I thought, wow, what a good question that is, because a lot of people think that a bottom is a blank canvas, and that is not mm. the case. There's a lot of skills involved in being a good bottom and a lot of ways of channeling the energy that, that you have to get good at. And so here I was having coffee with Dossie, who was one of the best bottoms I'd ever seen. And mm -hmm. I said, someone asked me this great question. Would you be interested in writing a book about that? Because I was at the time running Greenery Press that published all these books. And she said, well, yes, I think it's a great idea for a book, but I don't feel like I can write it by myself. I think I would need a colleague to write this. And so that was how we met. We wrote the book together. And then we wrote another book together, and then we wrote another book together, and then we wrote another book together, four in total. Uh, wow. So okay, that that's the deep background. Wait, wait, what was the what was the workshop on? Uh, it was called Pain Play with Canes, Pain Play with Canes from Psyche to Soma, because that's the way Dossie works. It, uh, wow. <laughs> we are both big fans of being on either end of a cane, and so that was just a, a really excellent way for us to connect, because you know. Even in front of an audience, something like that, where you're doing intense sensation play, it's deeply intimate. Um, 
And so we connected very deeply through this uh, demo. And we've been friends, colleagues, sometimes lovers, sometimes play partners, uh, always collaborators and lovers, whether it's physical lovers or emotional lovers, for 30 years next year. Wow, wow. that's so beautiful. You know what? I've never heard anyone say like um, lo physical lovers or what was that other one? Companion lovers? Emotional lovers. Emo well, because Erica and I, we always call each other platonic wives. We are emotional lovers because we support each other and all things, but we're not physical lovers. But now I have another term to add to our our our, our LinkedIn, <laughs> our, our emotional LinkedIn. My, my, my current marriage is that we are emotionally deeply bonded, but we are not sexual together, which is partly an age thing. And partly we have both had all the kinds of sex there are to have in the world and we're kind of done. So huh. we, we don't connect at that level. Um, I ran across a term the other day in a story I, I was reading uh, queer platonic. And so I went and looked it up because nobody can keep up with all the terminologies that are getting uh, made these days. But right. queer platonic is you guys and it's us. Um, it's a really useful construct. And I think that's also part of the um, way of looking at life that being an ethical slut involves is recognizing all of your love relationships as being important, whether or not they are sexual, whether or not they're romantic. Yeah, yeah, I think, I that's, think that's so important. important. I think we, 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 we talked, talked about, about that a lot last month on the podcast, podcast just how platonic love or queer platonic, platonic, queer platonic, <laughs> yes, it, it's not one of the easier ones to say. Uh, the, the actors, um, the actors, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, the British actors call that their relationship, they, they call themselves heterosexual life partners, which, you know, mm. gosh, so many mm. men are so bad at being nurtured by or nurturing other men. And so that just makes me happy in a deep place when I when I hear about men who are like that. Yeah, it's so it's so important to treat your friends just like you, you know, treat your lovers, check on them, tell them you love them, be like intent, you know, kind when you're having arguments and conversations, reach out when there's a disagreement. You know, I think a lot of times, you know, our, in friendships, we'll, we'll be quick to end a friendship, but we will keep a toxic lover around forever and ever. <laughs> So. Yeah, <laughs> we've all done it, and yeah, right. you're right. Um, can I ask, how old were you when you kind of entered into this space? Like how, like, and how did that happen? Like, what was the catalyst to, to all of this and opening up your slut sluttiness? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I my interest in BDSM is lifelong. I can remember having kinky fantasies when I was four, um, mm -hmm. but this is a generational thing. Uh, I had no role model for anything like that. I thought well up into my 20s, uh, pushing 30, that I was the only person in the world that wanted to get spanked or spank someone. It was just my little thing. And, I, and then when I found out that other people were the same, by then I was married and had two kids. And, you know, we tried to explore that between us, but it just wasn't his thing. And I had discovered that this was not a want, this was a need for me. That kind of sexual explorativeness and the desire for ecstatic experience, that's kind of hardwired in me, I think. And a fairly standard suburban marriage was not ever gonna meet it. And we didn't have a book like The Ethical Slut that might have taught us how we could have that and have the dear friendship that we had then and still have. We just didn't know how, so we divorced, which was probably honestly the best decision. We remained very good friends. Uh, we we co-raised our kids, full physical and legal custody. He's an important person in my life, but we should have stayed friends, I think is right. what that boils down to. We should not have tried to be spouses. And once we quit trying to be spouses, we got to be friends again, which was lovely. <laughs> um, for those, for some of our listeners that are not joining us on the book club, um, I'm just curious, I'm just wondering if you would be able to share with them, what is an ethical slut? An ethical slut is a human being of any gender or orientation who recognizes that sex, connection, romantic um, attraction are ways of fulfilling oneself and fulfilling other people, that it doesn't have to be done under the table 
uh, it can be done honestly and with full disclosure, and that all these things can be ways of growing and ways of helping the people we love grow. So we, we are not so much into limiting our possibilities, we sluts. Uh, we, we like to see a little bit of everything that's out there and choose at the time what looks good and what doesn't. But we also recognize that what looks, what looks good to us at 30 may not be what we want at 40. What looks good on us uh, good to us on Tuesday may not look good to us on Friday. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's, it's um, being open to possibilities, I think, is what it boils down to, including sexual possibilities. That's so beautiful. I've always been, I, you know, it's, 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 it's strange. Like that seems like a, a basic concept to like have ample possibilities and be open to them and have ample love and express that. And like that love doesn't, you know, it could be intimate. It could not. I've had such platonic, great sexual experiences, like one night stands. And I felt so fulfilled after I'm like, wow, that was great. That was a lovely person. And like, I don't have to explore a deep relationship with them later. Like I do have an issue with hoarding people, Erica calls it. And I call it like, I, I like to hold, like I'm cl not clingy. I don't really, I'm not needy, but I'll call someone, I'll keep up with them and I'll keep them in my life. But like, sometimes it's okay to have a platonic relationship and that, that, that person in that relationship doesn't serve you on a regular or active, you know, regular basis. Well, Dossie, and, Dossie and I like to point out that we've been doing what we do together for going on 30 years now. If we ever tried to live together, we would have to kill each other. We're, we're just, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we will occasionally go to a workshop and stay in a hotel room together for three or four days. And we're ready to be done at the end of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, she has this weird thought that I don't quite understand that you should only spend money you actually have. And I've never quite gotten that. And she also thinks it's important to do the dishes within a day after you get them dirty. And I don't quite get that either. So we're, we're not good models for the traditional um, monogamy centrist relationship where you live together. What we are is terrific models for different ways of being long term lovers with a person. I think it's so beautiful. I think as women, especially we, we, if you're lucky, you'll get the ethical sled in your lifetime. If you're lucky, you'll, you'll honor that part in yourself that says it's okay to have these platonic, you know, uh, experiences and encounters. But so often I feel like women are so riddled with shame, even from a small age that it, it literally fucks up your whole shit. It fucks up how you express yourself. It fucks up how you see yourself. Um, and often for some people who are, you know, don't ever get to receive the permission that it's okay and it, it's actually normal. It's like, it can really cause severe trauma with if you don't try to remove the shame of it all. Because I've told Erica so many times, like, I'm, I'm a sexual person and I've tried to be in certain type of monogamous relationships and then I cheat, or I fuck it up, or I get shamed and I feel bad about the explorative, you know, curious person that I am. And it's just, it's, 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 it's taken time to un unfold those layers and, and unlearn those things. So I just, I, I can only imagine how it was for you in a time where it was just so fucking vanilla and so strict and having these feelings, because a lot of times this is just deeply who the fuck you are. This is who I am. But I'm let so us not forget that I'm a child of the sixties. It has not always been the way it is now. Um, when I was young and beginning to explore, that was quite honored as a pathway for at least some communities. Um, but what happened to me, and I think what happens to some of us, is I met the guy that I would go on to marry, my first husband, and we just sort of defaulted to monogamy because that was what you did. We never talked about it. Um, it was just what we did. And then I, it, it felt almost like falling into a Rip Van Winkle sleep and waking up 10 years later going, wait, I don't remember ever saying I wanted this, but this is what I have now. Um, right. And when, when I ended that marriage, when we, when we parted, it was just very clear that I was never going to promise monogamy again. Um, and I never have. There have been times that I have been functionally monogamous, but with the understanding, the mutual understanding, that if I meet someone that looks appealing, uh, I'm going to go check that out. And we need to be, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're going to need to accommodate that. It's been a while, but yeah, I'm not saying it couldn't happen. <laughs> I'll be right back. I got to check some stuff out.
So, like, speaking of going down this journey of this monogamous marriage and then, you know, having this epiphany and coming out, and what, how old were your kids at that point? How did you, how did you like, uh, kind of transition them and how did you transition as a mother? You know, you've had this epiphany and then now honoring yourself, right? Because it's people have epiphanies all the time, but they don't, they stay in marriages, they stay doing shit they don't want to do. How did you say, I'm going to make this shift? And then how did you present it to your kids and how did that work out? Um, my kids were at the time, I think 12 and six. Um, and my, my ex and I told them that we weren't going to live together anymore. And there was kind of a big dark cloud over the household. We, we, we actually did stay together for a couple of weeks when, um, we were looking for other places to live. That was a very strange two weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, but we explained that, you know, we still both wanted to be part of their lives and we were going to make that happen. And we just felt it was better if we don't live together anymore. And so in the beginning, that's what we did. We each found an apartment in Sacramento where we were living at the time and just switched the kids back and forth. Um, in the beginning, they were with me during the weekend with him on weekends. And then when I fell in love with a person and with the kink community and moved to San Francisco, um, we switched that because they didn't want to change schools. So I became the weekend parent and he became the weekday parent, which meant meeting every Friday and Sunday in a midpoint in Vallejo for dinner, which in hindsight, I think was really great. I'm glad it worked out that way, although it was a, a logistical decision at the time. But those dinners, when we were sitting and chatting and trading books that we thought the other would like and so on, were how we rebuilt our friendship after, mm. you know, the difficulty of the marriage counseling and the breakup and all of that. Uh, it gave us a little intermediate space to begin to figure out who we were going to be to each other again. And that was how we kept on being friends. So that was great, although the commute was a bitch. <laughs> mm -hmm. fr Friday night from uh, uh, Santa Clara, where I was working at the time, to Vallejo is stop and go the whole way. Mm -hmm. So it just was what it was, and I did it. Um, and uh, I, I went through several years there in Sacramento of having a, a circle of fuck buddies, which is a pattern that's really comfortable for me. Um, we all knew each other. Several of us were sleeping with several others of us. Um, it was a pretty free floating tangle of people. Um, and it was fun. I did not introduce any of them to my kids as my lovers. They knew one or two of them as my friends, but I felt that I didn't want to bring anybody into their lives until I was pretty sure that they would be a long-term arrangement. So the first person I introduced to them as my lover was um, Jay, the man that I lived with for 13 years when I moved to the Bay Area. And so at that point, uh, yes, I did bring him into their lives. And then we, for a while, we had a, a housemate that I was occasional lovers with, Tom, and he, he met the kids too and was taken into their life as part of their family. Um, but my other partners, the people I was playing with and uh, having sex with, I, I did not present to my kids. Uh, it just felt like that would be too confusing to them. Then we got into a situation <laughs> where I was... Um, <laughs> involved with a much younger guy that I'd met online. And he did sort of become part of the household. He was around. Um, I, don't, I don't know whether my kids were aware that he was a lover or not, but we didn't tell them that. Um, but what happened was he wound up being really close friends and still is to my younger son. At which point I said, yeah, okay, uh, enough of the lover thing. That feels kind of weird and creepy. So let's not be that anymore. Let's just be friends. Mm -hmm. And he was. We, he was an a loved part of our household for all the years that we were in the Bay Area. And I just saw him again for the first time um, a couple of months ago when I happened to be in Sacramento. And yeah, he's, he's just dear. He's a dear person to me. And he and Ben uh, talk all the time. They talk almost daily. So it's still a really important friendship. They were roommates for a while. So this is what I was saying about the fluidity of being a slut is somebody can be your lover and then your friend and then your son's best friend and then your son's roommate and and so on. Uh, I suppose, in, at least in theory, if we lived close together, we could be lovers again, but probably not. That feels like history that doesn't want to be dug back up again. But that kind of fluidity is what I love. 
how I mean I think at some point was there any was there ever a point where like you had to have a conversation with your your son um, and and say like I I'm I'm in the BDSM community this is my thing this is my community these are my people um, I know there's there's obviously a lot of I think misconceptions too which I'd love for you to share about your community um, that you know you know one might fear sharing with your child you know I don't how has that benefited you and I'm sure your kids are grown now so like how do you think that's made like affected their lives and now that they're obviously they have a better understanding of who you are now that they're adults how do you think like that's shaped their personalities their openness or their or their lack thereof or whatever I don't know who they are so yeah 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 I don't I don't know what their their sexualities are at all um they keep that private and that's entirely appropriate. So we don't talk about that. Um, at the time when they were still young, uh, my partner then and I made the decision that it, it wouldn't have been our choice to be as closeted to them as we were, but we were both at that point becoming fairly visible people. We were on the national speaking circuit. We were giving interviews and we both knew from what we'd seen happen in other communities that if people who think BDSM or poly or whatever are awful, terrible things, uh, and they decide to get you for it, that's the first place they're going to look is your kids. And we wanted to be able to stand up in front of a judge if need be and say, no, we have kept this entirely separate. Our books are locked up. Our things are locked up. Um, so we did that until they turned 18, until the first one turned 18. And then we had a formal coming out thing, which it didn't surprise him even a tiny bit. He, he knew what outfits he'd seen me leaving the house in. He, you know, we used to give a big Christmas potluck every year and he'd probably been overhearing conversations between our friends there. But we, we um, maintained that formal boundary between that part of our life and my life as a parent until they were of age. When I was reading the um, you you have a chapter in the book about um, motherhood or parenthood, and um, I, I read this interesting part, and it, it it struck me I think because you know Jamila and I we are very transparent with our kids, obviously within with, with, within reason of what's appropriate, but we do you know I think we a lot of things that are I guess would be deemed taboo um, we like you know our kids know that we smoke cannabis um we are very upfront about having you know having our kids up understand their bodies and the proper names for them and just just honestly a answering questions in, in an honest way um and so when i was reading this chapter you were talking about how your kids did not choose your lifestyle and therefore and therefore when like kids come over when their friends come over if you have those inappropriate pictures hanging up or you have, you know, I guess remnants of your lifestyle around your home, it's respectful and it, and it should be, you know, I guess addressed in some capacity to remove them from your home so that your kid doesn't have to explain, doesn't have to explain, you know, mommy, you know, likes to spank people on the weekends. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and for me, I thought, I thought I, I was conflicted about that. To be honest, I was like, "Yes, I think that you, it's not your kid. Your kid didn't choose the lifestyle, you know. They they, um, they get to have their boundaries respected, right, um, right? And if one of their boundaries is, you know, keep it on the down low when my friends are here, then you do. That's that's respectful of their boundaries. Um, I I can't see any other way other to do otherwise when they've asked you. To keep it quiet strikes me as profoundly disrespectful. I do want to point out that there is a great deal of difference between the era in which this was happening to me and the era in which this is happening to you. Um, mm -hmm. All of these alternative lifestyles are much better understood and less taboo than they were when I was a young parent. Uh, which is not to say there isn't still trouble out there, but the chances of it turning into a real problem are lower now than they were then. Depending, of course, on what part of the country you live in, what your community is, uh, what your job is. Uh, you know, if you were a preschool teacher or a minister, then coming out might not be a good idea uh, right. to your kids yeah. or otherwise. Right. 
and I, and I thought about that too because I was like, this was like this this is a, this was a different time too. But even still, even still now, I mean, it, there is a lot of stigma attached to 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 lifestyles, even as open and things that are changing. I do think that. You know, for, you know, especially Jamila and I, we live in Los Angeles. And then, like, if you go to New York, if you go to Chicago, Atlanta, like, those places, you know, there's just a community and it's more open. But if you go to, like, these smaller towns, like, the, this is still very much, you know, hush, hush, taboo. And, like, you might have to you might have to be careful what you have in your home. You might have to be careful who comes over and your kids go through your shit because, you know, kids love to do that shit. I was that kid. I was that kid. I was like, what is this? <laughs> one one of the stories I've been writing, I, I, I'm working on another book, another memoir called Slut and Sons uh, that takes place in the period of time when my kids were still young and I was becoming well known as an author and speaker and educator in BDSM in Poly and how that balance happened back then. Um, and one of the stories I tell is finding um, a magazine under my son's mattress that he had stolen out of my nightstand. And the reason it was in my nightstand is that it had a story in it that I had written, a, a smutty story, fortunately published under a, a pseudonym. But it's going to happen. They're going to find your stuff. You, you, even if you choose not to be out to your kids, be prepared to answer questions if your secrecy doesn't hold up. Um, <laughs> it, if you come out to your kids to any degree, they need to know that you're safe. That's going to be their main concern, that you're not going to get hurt, that you're not going to get sick. Of course, back when this was all happening with me, AIDS was still a huge issue. Um, and so they needed to know I wasn't doing high-risk sex behavior. They needed to know I wasn't doing high-risk kink behavior. That's only fair. If you're dependent on someone, you know you want to know that someone is taking that someone is taking care of themselves. Right. Um, one of the things I know you were talking about, as far as um, like the fluidity that you've had in relationships um, over time, and I. I I, I often think about, obviously, jealousy is a really big, you know, issue in relationships um, and a lot of the reasons why people choose monogamy. And even in your book, you you have this quote where you say, let us point out that monogamy is not a cure for jealousy. And I love that quote because I think so much of that is based in why people are monogamous because they think that if they are monogamous, then it just eliminates that feeling of jealousy and like, I know you're mine, you're in, you know, you're, I'm yours. Um, but we all know that literally like monogamy is oftentimes the recipe for jealousy. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't think there's any way to escape jealousy. I mean, if you want to be celibate, then you can escape sexual jealousy, but you're still going to feel jealous about other things that people have that you don't. Um, it's just one of our insights about jealousy when we were working on the later editions of the book is that there is no one emotion that's called jealousy. Um, jealousy is a whole bunch of different emotions um, that it can be territorial, it can be insecure, it can be fearful, it can be competitive. Uh, and so that's one of the things I think that makes it so difficult to overcome jealousy is we treat it as though it were monolithic. And it isn't. It's, it can be any one of a number of things. And what my jealousy is might not be your jealousy. Um, and so you have to tease it apart and get a better read on what it is you're afraid of or angry about before you can begin to solve it. Uh, jealous, you know, anybody who's raised more, more than one child knows that jealousy is something that's pretty well programmed into us. I was going to say, I was going to ask you that. Do you think that jealousy is innate or it's a social construct? My dogs get jealous. I mean, if you're petting, <laughs> if you're petting one of them, the other one will come and try to stick itself between the two of them. Um, I, I think it's pretty much hardwired into not even being a mammal, in, into being a, a sentient being on the face of the earth. People, some people are going to have something that you want. And sometimes the answer is to get some of that for yourself, but sometimes the answer is to take it away from them. And that's what jealousy looks like, is somebody else wants something you have and or somebody you want something somebody else has, and you want to take it away from them so that you can have it. Which, you know, it's not a, not the 
best way of dealing with that problem, but it has to be unlearned and it has to be unlearned over and over. You never get so good at poly or at monogamy that you're not going to get sucker punched once in a while. Something's going to happen that you didn't know was going to be a problem and turns out it is. Uh, mm. And then you have to sit down and talk to yourself first about what it is you're feeling and then start looking for some help, whether it's from the person that's directly involved or from your friends in not feeling so bad. There's a lot of self-care techniques you can use. There's a lot of reassurances you can ask for. There's all kinds of ways to cope when what you, do you feel think jealous. Are, can, can you share maybe some self-care tips? Because I feel like jealousy is, is an overarching theme in so many of women's lives, especially as it pertains to their relationships with their lovers. So, In terms of just bringing yourself back to ground zero before you lose your shit and make it into a big thing, is what you would use to calm yourself anytime you were feeling a very strong negative emotion. If you're really angry, if you're really in deep grief, what what would you do to help? You might, if you're the kind of person who likes a bubble bath and some fresh flowers, then that's what you do to sort of get all that adrenaline back down. Uh, I like to exercise myself into exhaustion when I'm feeling really strong emotion, preferably something constructive like going into the messiest, shittiest part of the house and throwing stuff around until I can't move anymore, um, which is getting less and less appropriate as I get older. But there it is. I, I need to try this. Hmm. Like a like one of those break rooms. I need, I've need. i always wanted to go to one of those rooms where you just like go break shit. Yeah. Um, Dossie likes Less? to play solitaire to calm herself when she's feeling um, overly stimulated. Uh, so it's just a matter of finding what works for you yourself. Some people like to journal. Some people like to draw. Some like to dance. Uh, it's just a matter of what works best with your limbic system to get it back down to where it needs to be. And then you can start talking to people about what you need to not feel so bad. Mm. I So I... Um... When I, with my child's father, we broke up and then I started dating and I had been in that relationship and it was a monogamous relationship. At least I was monogamous, but he was ethically non-monogamous, unethically non-monogamous. Happens. Um, yeah. Um, but after that, because even in that relationship, like it was the same thing. Like we entered in this relationship and it was just monogamous because that was like the only option I thought we had. And I always knew that I was interested in women I always knew that I was interested in exploring like you know I guess threesomes or group sex elements and just I, I guess in some just like uninhibited love and sex um and so when I when I ended that relationship um I started seeing someone and we were under we were dating under the, the circumstances that he was he knew that he could not be monogamous um it was just not physically possible for him and but that he loved me and that we were going to date and we were going to be open. And so I was like, great, I finally get to explore this this space with someone that I care about. And so I did. But really, I just defaulted back to monogamy because it was just something that I was so used to doing. And when I love someone, I'm very hyper focused on them. So I literally like I had to like force myself to like open myself up in that way. And the only reason that it happened was because one day we were out and he showed me his phone and some woman was texting him and I could tell that it was like very emotional. And I was like, and we had, we had not been, we had been saying we're non-monogamous, but we hadn't ever really talked about what we were doing. So it came as like this, like, oh my God, like, oh no. I was like, oh shit. Like, you love someone else too? How the, when are you, when do you have the time? I'm with you all the time. Uh. Like, <laughs> Um, and, and I, we were in the, we were actually at a museum. We were like walking through this like very like fine art museum when you showed me this text by accident. And I was like, okay. And I just remember like, okay, Erica, like you have to breathe because what are you going to do? You're not going to throw a fit because you agreed to this shit. Okay. So let me just, I did so much breathing and so much talking to myself and like, and then by the end, by the time I left that museum, because I had literally just had so many conversations with myself about, you wanted to do this. This is this is the this is part of the the growing pain of navigating in a new space. It's fucking uncomfortable at first, and it feels foreign. And then you're like, do I want this? Because this doesn't this feels not good, or I don't know how this feels. But 
I think that's with any space. But by the time I left that museum, like I was like, I almost felt excited in a way because I was like, oh, well, I I need to go do my thing. Like I just gave myself permission. And also like just excited, just like that, you know, this is a new space that I'm in. I'm ex- I'm excited to navigate through all of the feelings and it doesn't have to be this like scary negative thing. I, did, I knew that he didn't love me any less, even though there was a... a a process of me like, who this is bitch? Who the fuck is she? What does what she, she look? What like? does she look like? I need to see what she looks like. Women always want to know. We it's always want to know Must what she face. looks like. Must know what she looks like so we can talk shit. Like <laughs> <laughs> it's just this comparison thing. Um, but now I'm in a space, and this was like two and a half years ago, where um, I feel very little jealousy, like in relationships. I, I, I there's like a. It's a practice thing. It's like learning and, yoga. And you and can bend a little so farther freeing. each time. Yes. It really feels so freeing. Like I, there's moments where I catch myself, but I do not dwell. I'm not a dweller. And like, it's just feels so liberating, whether you are in a monogamous relationship or whatever relationship you are to like really, tr- really focus on the jealousy part because A, it ain't cute. B, it's, it's, it's stressful. It's draining. And see, it's just, I just feel like, especially with sex, like, I think, like, for me personally, like, I would not end a relationship because my partner had sex with someone else, especially if, like, we were, uh, especially, unless that would, I don't even think if that was the agreement, I would do that. I think because sex is important, but, like, my emotional bond and, like, my trust is not wrapped up all in my, se- all in sex. I mean, I, I, I understand that. I, I've had sex that's not emotionally driven, so I understand that. But, you know, it's interesting. I have a interesting relationship with jealousy as we're having this conversation it's like reminding me like growing up my parents my mom was crazy jealous crazy jealous like constantly asking my dad where he was going constantly like a a woman would pass by and say hi like who is that bitch (laughs) (laughs) and a a really uh, painful way to live like that and and i thought that and i saw that i said god that's painful and i also saw my dad do stupid shit and like be neglectful and and be and have outside relationships i saw how it affected her um but it made me say for one a i felt and I understand, like, if you haven't developed this part of yourself and this, like, I, it made me, f- it, I felt like it was weak. I felt like it was weak because you are in, essentially putting yourself in this position with this person that is obviously an unethical slut, but you're, it doesn't, you know, and obviously it, that adds to someone's insecurity. That adds to someone's jealousy. Um, so when I, as I got older and I experienced jealousy, it irritated me to feel that way. You know, like, I don't want to feel this way. Like, honestly, it was between, like, not wanting to have attachments to people. But but as I've evolved and had these conversations when I do care about people and things come up and I'm, like, I'm able to be, like, how much do I really care? Do I still love them? Yes. Do they still love me? Probably. And also, like, I don't have a fear of, like, I don't have a fear of losing someone. Like, I'm a cool, I'm cool. And you, you know, we're le- you're lucky to have me. And like, if I don't want to be in fear of someone stealing my person, and you know, honestly, I'm like working through a lot of like childhood trauma right now. And I'm my parents are still this way, you guys. Nothing has changed. They're still married. They're still the same people. And it it makes me really sad. It makes me sad that like you didn't have the opportunity to um, have the ethical slut to to release those feelings. Like I just feel like how much of your life did you waste with these emotions? It's so unhealthy. Uh, my parents' marriage ended over serial infidelity. Um, and I wonder sometimes if I had written this book in time for them, whether they'd still be together and what that might look like. You know, I li- I'm like, I think we need to gift the book to her parents. I used to think that my behavior was a rebellion to the way I grew up. I'm like, am I doing this too as a, like a, a reactive as like the, the things that I've witnessed, you know? Uh, there's, there's a term in the poly community. Uh, it's called compersion. That is the feeling of being happy to see your partner happy with someone else. Um, and a lot of educators define it as the opposite of jealousy, but I don't think it is. I think it is entirely possible to feel both jealousy and compersion at the same time, where part of you is happy to see your partner having a great time with someone else, and part of you is feeling a little small and jealous about the whole thing. That happened to me at the sex club with, with you. With me. <laughs> 
Um, we share that story on our Patreon, guys. So if you want to hear about our experience at the sex club in Brooklyn, um, you should. Because I think I spoke yeah, there a couple of years back. I, I know the place yeah, you're talking about that. Can't wait to go back. Can't, can't wait. Nice folks. Nice <laughs> folks. I had a very good time there. Um, so about I, I just have a question about monogamy because we just we recently did at our at our book club we did a poll and we asked our you know the people that are in the club like how what kind of relationship um, structure are they currently interested in or are in and most of them you know said monogamy um, some of them I think it was like six percent said poly a few said monogamish. Um, but overall, it was monogamy, which kind of surprised me only because, um, you know, because the, I don't know, I, I guess I assumed that someone who would pick up this book is it's because they are either interested in other alternative lifestyle or monogamishy, or they are already, you know, tapped into that. Um, what are your views on monogamy? I know there's a chapter in here where you praise monogamy. And for me, sometimes I feel like monogamy can almost be, can be kind of like a kink in some capacity. Like, yeah. Um, my colleague, Tristan Taramino calls it radical monogamy. And I think that that's kind of cool. I like the idea. I have nothing against monogamy as long as it's freely chosen. If someone takes a look at all the options there are on the buffet and says, you know, this is the one that looks good to me and nothing against these other ones. But at this point in my life, I want to be monogamous. Go. I'm, I'm all for it. I think it can be um, a great relationship. It isn't for me, but for example, my first husband, I think, is just deep down in his hardwiring. He's a monogamous guy. And he's read my books. I mean, he knows there are other options, but that's not what he wants. Um, so as long as everybody is choosing it freely um, and with awareness of, its, of the other options, I think it can be a really good way to go, particularly if you have a lot of other commitments in your life to work or making art or the things you do, um, it may not be that you want to put the amount of energy and effort into maintaining multiple relationships that could otherwise happen. So it's just an issue of what's important to you at the time. As I am, I'm, I'm, as I am journeying in my relationships and, understanding what I want out of a partner. I've been more leading into um, monogamish, whereas before I was open, um, which I find, I, I'm like, is this my life going to be like this all the time? Like, not, I don't want to say flip-flopping, but like... It will evolve. You'll feel differently at different times. You'll feel differently with different partners. With you, this is what I feel like. With you, I feel like we have a space to be more open because this is just who we are. I think it kind of will change and shift however way you feel. I, I think if we all lived in a world where we all had access to all the dishes on the buffet, uh, what would happen in many cases is we would want to slut around when we were young and exploring. And then during our years of being parents, we might want to be monogamous because God knows an active parent has enough on their plate without trying to maintain multiple relationships. And then when we get older and more established in our careers and the kids aren't demanding constant attention, we might want to be poly again or open or monogamish or whatever and then going on into old age some of us might choose to be celibate um it's it's about maintaining the possibilities and not judging them except as to how useful they are to you at the time amen amen I, yeah that makes sense to me i feel like the more I talk to my grandma and she's the disappointment she has in God for making her work and men not work, <laughs> I'll probably be more of a lesbian again. <laughs> I would be pissed off too if I were her. That's that's a, an excellent thing to be unhappy about. She was like, you know, I just want to let you know, God really, he played an evil trick on women. I'm like, what's going on? She's like, I work fine. Everything's fine. None of these men can do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you hear me arguing? <laughs> I, I, if I had another lifetime <clears throat> to be a writer and educator, I would be looking at, in particular, heterosexual cishet men um, and what a raw deal they've been dealt and how they need, what they need to get their shit back together. Because I think they're uh, often pretty broken these days mm -hmm. and I would want to help fix them. If I, if I could start all over again and do something different. Really? You, you know, know, it's so funny. funny. 
Jamila said something to me recently, or like, we should do something for the men or some shit. And I was like, I'm not working for these men. Like, I was like, but, but, but I, 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 I get, get it. it. But I, I, I said, well, what are we going to do when all the women are healed and ready and, and, and open and smart and, and, and the men are, there's, there's no one, there's no, we're going to be a community, community of lesbians. I know, I know you're, you're totally, totally right. right. It, just it just felt, felt like, like, oh my, oh my God, God, it's such, it's a, daunting 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 task. Task. such a daunting task. task. Must, Must we fix everything? Yes. Fuck. I had a theory when Queer Eye for the Straight Guy was first on the air and a huge hit that what was drawing us to it was the opportunity to see men taking care of each other and not depending on women to do it. Mm. And uh, that to me was really healing to watch. Oh, here's a great story. I was told um, by a gay man at an event where I was speaking. He, he said, I, I have the, the cure for jealousy. And I said, okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, tell me I'll make a million dollars. He said, no, here's the cure for <laughs> jealousy. Um, my boyfriend had another boyfriend who I really didn't much like. And the guy showed up at our house one day when my boyfriend wasn't home and when I said so, he said, would it be okay if I take a nap in your spare room? Because I'm exhausted and I really need to sleep for a while. And I couldn't think of a reason to say no. So I said, sure, and showed him to the spare room. And then I thought, you know, I'm kind of tired too. And I got on the bed and took a nap with him. And seeing him there sleeping and totally open and totally vulnerable, I couldn't dislike him anymore. I didn't feel jealous anymore. And I thought Aww. that was the sweetest story ever. It is so that sweet. Is sweet. Like, you just need to watch your lover's lover sleep. It's kind of like a mother and her child. Like, you know, when you look at your child and you're like, I, you just, I just love you so much. You're just innocent, not talking. Maybe if we saw more people sleep, there'd be more compassion in the world. Maybe. Maybe we need to just, we need, we need sleep cams. There, there's an exercise in Buddhism that's to imagine someone awful as a, a tiny child that you're taking care of and cradling in your arms. Um, it, there is something about seeing someone that pure and vulnerable that it's it's hard to be mad anymore it's true it's true i've seen some of the most not nice people sleep and been like wow you were a child once right 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 what happened right (laughs) that's a big question isn't it (laughs) that's my problem what happened how can i help let me open up your mind let me be let me fix you let me heal you you deserve love there's so much love to be given no. <laughs> yeah, that's the trap, isn't it? Sixty-six years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fuck. Where do you draw the line for love? I love you, but I have boundaries. <laughs> I can't fix. I can't do it all. Um. Well, and actually, that's a good question. Before we go, how do you draw the line of boundaries? And having being an ethical slut that like kind of like blurs boundaries and like kind of leaves you open. Like, how do you actually? Because I do think that there's in some capacity. And I, I, maybe you disagree. I think people do need boundaries. Oh, you know? absolutely. Like, no, not not having boundaries is a really uncomfortable and dysfunctional way to live. Um, I think the boundary that works for me is it has to do with knowing what's mine to control and what is not. And I don't get to control who you're sleeping with. That's you. I do get to control what you bring home to me. And if you come home to me angry because of something that happened with them, then I need to set a boundary. That's mm. that, This is not my job to fix. Um, if, you, if you read my, my memoirs, my personal writing, you'll see that I come back again and again to the idea of skin as a boundary and knowing that what's inside my skin is mine and I have to take care of it. And what's outside my skin, it's not my job. Uh, and I'm speaking here as someone who did try to fix an awful lot of people in my day and who got mostly through it in um, therapy. And I, I just keep coming back to that. It, it, this is not mine to control. This is not mine to fix. Mm-hmm. What I get to control is the things that affect me directly. Yes, I love that. I love that. I do. I'm going to use that. I'm going to have to adopt that mantra. Um, um. Yes, maybe that was the affirmation you asked me about in the beginning. Right. Maybe, maybe I need to like save some time right now. Um, I have, okay, so we have a, a segment on our show that we call Horries. It's short for horror stories. It's like the most slutty, 
fun. It could either be like highly, hor- highly horrific or funny or just like a wonderfully slutty, top notch slut experience story. If you have any, I think that you actually do. The, the, the thought that came to my mind as soon as you said that was a wonderful scene that I was part of at um, a kink conference in Canada. And the idea of the scene was to enable a very large husband to fist his very tiny wife for the first time. And so a bunch of us women got together in the room there with them, and we held our hands up against each other to see who had the smallest hands. I have very large hands, so I went last. Um, and each of us in turn fisted her, and while I, all the rest of us were holding her and caring for her and, and being sort of handmaidens uh, until I went last because big hand, and then he, she was open and turned on and happy enough that he was able to slide his hand in and fist her for the first time. And it was just miraculous. It was so loving. The energy was so sweet that we were helping this couple make something happen that, that they couldn't make happen on their own. I get teary talking about it. It was just incredibly moving. (laughs) Talk about a village. Wow. Yes, it really was a village. (laughs) And I love how, like, deeply emotional it it makes you, like, that you were able to facilitate that for a couple. That's so beautiful. Yeah, it's one of my scenes that I still get teary about talking years later because it really was moving. And it was, I had this profound moment of, oh, my God, I love my life. (laughs) Other people don't get to do this. I I often feel that way too, even in this space and being able to interview, you know, someone like you and, you know, just, I'm just so, um, I'm grateful for you coming on the show. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for being open to doing this and holding space for us. Thank and you for writing this incredible book, you guys. You thank guys you. Have- Tell Dossie we said thank you too. This has helped us tremendously. Please. Yeah, Dossie, yes, yes. Dossie had major surgery on her spine yesterday. I'm heading down there in a week or so to help with her recovery. Uh, then oh, I will be God. sure to communicate um, your best wishes to her. And I also Please. want to tell you... Tell your listeners that I am blogging the book in progress at www.slutandsons.com. So if they want to hear about a lifetime of a good mom making bad choices. (laughs) Hey, oh my gosh. You guys, make sure you pick up The Ethical Slut. This is such an important book for for men too. Buy it for your husbands, your boyfriends. You know, black and brown, us black and brown girls, we need to read this shit. There's a lot of like a lot of undoing that we have to do around sexuality. I think even more so in some ways, uh, a lot of ways. So make sure you get this book. Um, if you haven't joined our book club, please, please join. We're, we're reading Do- um, Dossie and Janet's book all through September, and we're doing meetups, um, which are getting. We've had one so far, and it was so wonderful. Um, where can we so they they can find you on that specific website? Is that where we, we should yes? Get the that that would be the best place to find me right now. I do have an author site, but it's kind of in transition. Um, so yes, you can find me on sluttonsons.com. Sluttonsons.com. I'll be joining you on this journey because I'm excited to hear all about it. Okay, cool. Love love to see you there. And uh, you guys can find us. Um, that's Good Moms underscore Bad Choices on Instagram. On Twitter, we are Good Mom underscore Bad Girl. Make sure you re- rate and review this episode on Apple Podcasts. Please, please do that right now. Please. Um, and if you do want to hear about our sex club story and so many other uh, roll ups that we have over there, we have a segment on our Patreon called The Roll Up, where me and Mila roll up our weed and we talk shit and we say a lot of stuff we don't say on the podcast. So make sure you go check that out. That's patreon.com backslash good moms, bad choices. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.